Okay, everybody, we're at the next edition of Meet the Founders, and today I'm joined by uh, retired ambassador, uh, Harry Thomas, and this is going to be a great conversation, Harry. I've been looking forward to this for a while. Uh, I've only worked with a handful of ambassadors before you. They've all been articulate, intelligent, uh, keen individuals, and you are no exception. And I'm, I'm very, very, I feel very fortunate to have you uh, on the board with us on the VetCoin Foundation. Um, but you know a lot more about you than I do. So if you could take a few minutes and kind of describe yourself um, to the audience, please. Well, thank you for having me, Russ. And it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you and your family for your service to our nation. Uh, I was born in New York City. My parents were from South Carolina. I have an older sister. My daddy was in World War One. I'm sorry, World War Two and Korea. Uh, he was in the uh, 101st in in uh, Korea, although they didn't jump in World War Two. He was in a, a service unit. Uh, my grandfather was in World War One. Uh, we have a long tradition of people in our family who have served. Uh, and continue to serve to this day in every war that the United States has had from World War One through today. So I'm a rarity in our family who has not been in the military, but I, I thank every one of them. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, um, I just interviewed Teresa uh, a few days ago, and she she and I talked a bit about military lineage within families mm -hmm. and how uh, military service is increasingly a generational, like family business almost, in that, you know, parents were server served, grandparents, and then children, and then, like, my son is like the fourth consecutive generation to to join the military, the army specifically. Um, so it's very interesting to hear that you have such a strong military um, presence in your family group. Mm -hmm. So now I'm now I'm curious uh, why why you chose the foreign service. Well, actually, I wanted to go to West Point and then the Naval Academy, and I didn't get in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you showed them their mistakes, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, and that bothered me for years. Uh, but friends of mine got the appointment. I went to an engineering high school to, to do that. So at that time, sent more boys to the military academy than any high school in the country. Uh, because in New York had a large population, so they had more congressional districts. But uh, when I went to to Holy Cross, I was briefly in in ROTC, and I decided I didn't want to do that. And then I went to graduate school in New York, uh, started working for a non-governmental organization run by uh, Ed Logue, a guy who built Family Hall and Quincy Market in Boston, and Roosevelt Island in New York, and he told me about the Foreign Service, and it was Ed that got me to take the test and join, although he described himself as a washed out navigator, a washed out <laughs> pilot who became a navigator in, in World War II and uh, did, I think, 25 or 26 combat missions, uh, but that was not atypical where I grew up in Queens. Everybody's father had been in the military, you know, because you, you were in World War II, some in Korea. It, you reminded me um, of an experience that I had one of the first times I worked with an embassy staff um, during my time in uniform. And I I wish I could remember this ambassador's name. I can see him clear as day. We had a lot of really good engagements. Yeah. It was when I was in uh, Ethiopia mm -hmm. and he was great. Um, he loved DOD. His son was serving in the army at the time. Uh, Don Yamamoto? Yes, yes, he's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and we were we were just standing in the hallway having a conversation, and it was me and a a major um, army guy, and we were talking to the ambassador, and he was we were, and I don't remember how it came up. He was telling us about his son. He said I wanted to join the army too, but they told me I'm too short because he was only like five foot two oh, or yeah. something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he's like I wasn't tall enough to be in the army, so. I came to foreign service. <laughs> yes, I know Don well. He was very proud of his his son. And yes, actually uh, went to serve in some uh, tough places because his son was stationed there. Well, I, that's that's super fortunate and lucky for him. 
Um, so I shared a story about one of the ambassadors that I worked with who's very personable. How, I'd really love to hear a story from you about maybe some DOD folks that you worked with when you were you know, an, an ambassador in a foreign country and how impactful that might have been. Well, two come to mind, uh, retired Navy Captain Gus Gustantine and retired Lieutenant General uh, Fran Baudet. They were both 06s when I was in the Philippines and Joint Special Operation Task Force Philippines. Very different men. Uh, uh, Gus was extremely thoughtful, extremely cerebral, thought that we'd been fighting or assisting the Filipinos fight for over 100 years in Mindanao in the southern Philippines without uh, peace. So he looked at the way Pershing developed his strategy in the Philippines um, and tried to implement that. But you can't do that in a year. That's the challenge, you know? Right. And then Fran, Fran came in very much about learning the language, trying to partner with the Philippine military, trying to get them to train. But it showed me how two different kinds of leaders in the military could be extremely effective. And I'm, I'm fortunate to be in touch with them both to this day. Uh, luckily, when we had in the Philippines and Bangladesh, we used to have uh, tremendous uh, typhoons and monsoons, and the U.S. military would always come uh, come in to assist USAID in saving lives of people. And it was nothing like seeing uh, U.S. Uh, Air Force or Navy uh, personnel come on the ground and, and do their stuff. But you know. If you go back to Bangladesh, uh, the, the two things never left me that we had, uh, you know, part of their duties in the Navy would be you could volunteer to do civic work. And when I was in Bangladesh, uh, these sailors volunteered to, to build a small school. You know, it's like one room, two room schoolhouse. And then they said, well, where's the bathroom? There were no funds from the government of Bangladesh for the bathroom. And these sailors, you know, they were all, you know, under E5. And they reached in their pocket and, and bought the materials and built the built that bathroom, a latrine for boys uh, and girls, uh, also in the Philippines, every couple of years, as they do around the world. The, the Navy reservists come who are uh, optometrists, uh, and uh, to help people who have cataracts uh, and they work with the local uh, doctors, which is extremely important because they have to be trained. You know, they come every couple of years. But the biggest impact in Bangladesh and the Philippines were the veterinarians, the army veterinarians, because in the third world, world wealth is a lot of times through your cattle. And showing these people, helping to save their cattle uh, showing these people uh, how to better care for their for their cattle, which was their wealth, important for marriages, school fees, sometimes food, was was key. And those are aspects of our foreign policy uh, that uh, sometimes the American people don't know about. Maybe we don't do enough good enough job publicizing the things we do uh, to to help the average person. Uh, and as you know, the Philippines gets typhoons at 300, 350 miles an hour. Oh, it's really serious. But yep. Uh, so uh, you know, we. It, it, I'm a big believer in helping people, uh, but you help people in a disaster by enabling them to continue their occupation, where they can still uh, purchase things, buy things throughout the the floods, throughout the typhoon, throughout the earthquake. You don't want to give uh, food if they have food. You depress the prices, you know? <laughs> yeah. you know uh, You're right. You have, to, you have to be careful about what kind of help you give. And right. all help isn't equal. We don't want dependency. And you have to yep. talk to the local people. They know what they need. You know? <laughs> you know, they they, they kind of do. And, and so... Uh, we work closely with the military, and it was very important also. I always wanted the military to be on um, television, 
these days, I guess, would be social media, do interviews because uh, showing them in their uniforms, helping people was also a key aspect of foreign policy. And I think you can apply yeah. to social media. The so, military wasn't coming in to do that. Um, um, so you're, you're obviously a co-founder. We wouldn't be having this conversation. And, and for those at home, um, you can find an interview where Harry did with me and, uh, and Dr. Bazin when we first started uh, VetCoin, the idea, gosh, it feel, that was probably like, what, eight months ago we did yeah. this? Last yeah. summer, maybe? And we talked a bit about, you know, cryptocurrency and what VetCoin was going to try to do in the crypto space. And you asked some pretty interesting questions uh, during that interview, um, which is available, by the way, if you guys, I wish I had the link in front of me or I knew how to post it here, or I, I would do it. Maybe our tech team can figure that out later. Um, but you, you brought up a couple different cryptocurrencies that you would, um, at least some familiarity with. Um, so if you could kind of talk a little bit about your perspectives and experience and, and how you see cryptocurrency, like in the developing world or what we refer to as the developing world, which is in a lot of cases, they're ahead of us on adopting technology. So what maybe what have, what have you seen and experienced and how do you see that playing out um, in the areas we've worked? Thank you for that question, Russ. It's so important that people know the legitimate uses in the developing world for uh, cryptocurrencies in Zimbabwe, where there's no cash, um, and they ran out of the U.S. dollar, people use it to cryptocurrencies to purchase cars. They purchase used cars from Japan, put 50% down, and goes through the New York exchange, crypto exchanges in, in New York, and that's how the average person can buy a car that they badly need in a place where bus transport is unreliable in the best of in the best of times. In Central America, we see countries like uh, El Salvador adopting cryptocurrency usage as a, a future way. Uh, these com com countries have a hard time with exchange rates, be it from the US or Japan, it weaken them. And they're looking for different ways to have their people because they have uh, soft currencies that do not uh, uh, cannot are not hard currencies and can't be readily exchanged. We utilize, and I think this is the future. And the last thing any of us want to be is the old guys who who are you know the <laughs> the Debbie no nos and um, that we know this is not the future. You can't stop the future, and you you want to offer it to everybody. And I think that's the great thing about cryptocurrency is that everybody in every country can use it. So that that's a, I love that perspective. Um, in when I've had conversations with folks about emergent technology or the new thing, uh, two examples come up frequently. One is nobody knew they needed a smartphone until after Apple built the iPhone. Mm -hmm. And then everybody realized that that was something that they wanted. And before the iPhone came out, the common example was, well, when Henry Ford was building the car, the automobile, people never thought it would take off. They just want more horses, right? Yeah, yeah. Horse, was, horse reigned supreme and nobody was want, wanting to give up their horses for this new thing called cars. Now, I mean, if you look around the world, the combustion engine is really what's helped progress technology development and economies around the planet. Uh, so I love that that whole, you know, looking at the concept of like, people are going to use what they need to use. And when you don't have a physical commodity or physical currency, which we are increasingly short supply, even in the US, it's, it's all digital digitized. You know, you swipe your card, you tap your phone and you're paying for something. You never actually have cash right. so much anymore. And in the places where, cash was hard to get in the first place, of course, they're gonna be an early adopter. Yes, and uh, people were utilizing this in Zimbabwe when I got there in 2016. They already were, and, and I would tell people in America they were surprised because uh, they had the wrong impression of crypto. Yep, yep. And so I, I welcome this advancement. Uh, 
just like we talked about uh, people in, a, in typhoon and crises, people in other countries will adapt to what they can utilize uh, to make their lives better for them and their children. Um, and I think that, uh, especially in the third world where you have to pay school fees, being able to find a way to help people pay school fees through, uh, through cryptocurrencies as they're doing in, in Central America, is, is a wonderful, a wonderful development. So this is going, you can, uh, no one has ever been able to stop the future. No one has ever been able to stop progress. <laughs> uh, you know, and it's just moving faster than it ever has before. I'm yes. Sure there was somebody that didn't want fire, somebody that did not want a cart, you know, clearly there was somebody who didn't want the press you know, but the, you know, the Gutenberg Bible, think about that, you know? Uh, yeah. So Who, all of that. Yeah. Okay. So I want to, I want to switch it back a bit uh, more to Bitcoin. Yeah. So, you know, we, we had, had ca very casual conversations about Bitcoin. Uh, Alex and yourself invited us to talk about it, which was fantastic. And then we co-opted you and brought you and you and Alex both into the, into the co-founder community for VetCoin. Neither of you were hesitant at all. Like, absolutely. Like, I don't know if there was an intuitive, like this is the right thing to do, but I'm interested from your perspective, like me and Aaron and Joey and a couple others were talking about this crazy idea about a cryptocurrency to give back to veterans that hadn't been done before. Crypto market is super volatile. Uh, lots of naysayers, yet you were immediately attracted to, to the concept. So I'm very interested for you to share why that was the case. Well, A, the quality of the people who started it, B, to give back to veterans, and C, a, a unique opportunity. Um, look, we have seen the challenges veterans face in our, our nation. Uh, for your listeners in the Philippines, we have the only overseas VA hospital. And we had over 300,000 veterans living there when I was there. Uh, some fine, some with challenges. And why not, uh, why not help these guys? We had the 10th largest American Legion in the world in what was the Air, Old Clark Air Base. Why not help these people? Uh, my wife and I went to uh, a city, local cigar bar once and we met one of the Black Hawk Down pilots uh, who was hawking his cigars as well as his bourbon. <laughs> More importantly, he had gone back to school. Uh, it took him years to graduate so that he could become a psychologist and social worker with VA. He was telling me of the challenges uh, within the soft community. Um, and then uh, Captain Gus Gustantine that I referred to earlier uh, works through a foundation that the Boston Red Sox have to help the soft community and their, uh, their children, their spouses. And they do wonderful work, wonderful work, but the number of people they can help each year is limited. That's true. And I thought, wow, if we can also, through uh, Vetcoin, help help others. Uh, uh, as as out of shape as I am, I try to do the twenty two push ups uh, for the vets who who were committing suicide. I was thinking about that this morning. Yep, twenty two vets a day uh, committing suicide. So uh, we need, and I I know that. Uh, I've seen the effect on some of my relatives who come back from combat. Yeah, no, nobody comes back unaffected. Um, a particular, and even just military service has an impact on people's lives, often positive, but sometimes negative. And we've, we've talked in the past about the, what the VA can provide. And the VA's made tremendous improvements, uh, particularly over the last 10, 15 years. But there's a delta between what the community needs and what the VA can do and how the VA can provide it. And, and the users aren't you know, innocent either. They get frustrated, they, they don't wanna go, they're, they're embarrassed about the help they need. 
And there's no shortage of nonprofits out there that want to help. So now we've created a new one, right? We've created another nonprofit to help. Um, but I think- A unique one, a unique one. When, and, and exactly. So when we talk about like, we're going to connect, enable, and transform the community, it's really about enabling other nonprofits through the cryptocurrency access to capital. Of course, there's always, you know, servicing veterans and helping people, you know, potentially connect with a veteran business that can provide the, the goods or services that they need. But ultimately, it comes down to how can we use that connection to enable nonprofits to help the service members that need it? Yeah, look, I was so impressed that uh, Bitcoin and in, in the launch helping a, a young captain uh, with his business and you had a runner up, uh, you know, when we think it's Memorial Day weekend now, we're thinking about the, the people and we don't want to be, and I'm not really being critical, but we just don't want to be the, the, the person who raises the flag, salutes, and then goes back to have a beer and a barbecue. Uh, we want to make a difference in people's lives. And uh, that also is something that I'm, I'm tremendously proud of to be part of that is going to make it, you can make a difference in people's lives. You don't have to really brag about it, but I think we do have to publicize what we're doing uh, so the, the global community can learn about it. And I also think that long term, if we are able to work with allies and partners, countries, you know, we talked to one time about the Philippines where they used to be in the U.S. Army. Um, they still train with us. And if they yep. can make their own uh, a similar vet coin that we can help them with, because they're still fighting terrorists in, in Mindanao, you know, 100, 150 years later. So all those options. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to me because um, you don't recognize things at the time occasionally. And then you, in reflection, you realize yeah, that the things really are, um, or that they're, they're more than you thought at the time. So I worked at the Joint Special Operations University um, for a period of time and did international education. And one of the first students I met um, that came to Tampa to attend one of my courses, the first course I ran, I was brand new. Uh, I wasn't sure exactly what, how it was gonna go. And the first student I met was a Philippine SEAL. And he was so proud um, of both being a, a Philippine naval officer, but also being a SEAL mm -hmm. and being in the U.S. to get education. Mm -hmm. And it was, it, it, was, it was poignant and memorable. Mm -hmm. And now that we've had our conversations over, the over time about the Philippines and meeting your family and Elmer, you know, talking about the Philippines, and learning things like, oh, there's over, you know, hundreds of thousands of US veterans in the Philippines, so many that we have a VA system out there and a VFW. And then learning more about you know, the, the, the unique uh, relationship that the Philippines has with Naval service in particular, and how easy, like I had no idea how many Filipinos there were in the US Navy and how how like we had recruiting offices in the philippines specifically so like the only international recruiting like yeah you can join the u.s navy and it's okay that you're not a u.s citizen yeah. which is pretty uncommon but not for philippines in the navy yeah um and that's going beyond just the historical relationship that we had uh prior to and then during the second world war mm -hmm. so all that just to kind of encapsulate that my exposure to Philippine service members has been positive, universally positive. Um, and, and you were talking earlier about how US service members in other countries, particularly where you've been, how their service is, is beyond their job. You know, you talked about the, the young enlisted folks that chipped in to buy building materials and to help build something to improve the lives of the Bangladeshis. And, and I'm sure there's, scores of examples of that people just doing what they should do because it's what they should be doing even if they're not asked or told to do it um so there's there's no shortage of examples for us with you know when it comes to service 
And it's no surprise that we created our, our foundational values around the word service. But for, for folks that say like aren't military or they're or maybe not even government service folks and we talk about VetCoin, what kind of questions do you get? How do you talk about like why, why people that aren't connected to the service or the military should even care about VetCoin? Well, the first question I get is still, what is VetCoin? What is <laughs> cryptocurrency uh, from folks my age? And it gives me an opportunity, I welcome those questions because it gives me an opportunity to explain the blockchain, how it can enable it, explain cryptocurrencies and tell them, yes, it is volatile, but so is, so is the stock market. So is the real estate yeah. market. So is the insurance market. Uh, and, and they go, yes. And you can see the skepticism still in, in uh, some of their faces. And I also say, it's a wonderful way for you to connect with your children or grandchildren, because trust me, they know about it and they believe in it. You're going to need their help. <laughs> <laughs> and that works if they say, well, wait a second, I can have a conversation with my daughter or son or grandchild. This is something I want to talk to them about. It gives me an opportunity to share something with them. So I said, yeah, go, go talk to them and come back. Uh, and most of them do come back and they genuinely are, uh, whether they are from the, the community, most are not uh, interested in helping, finding ways to help veterans. Um, they, they truly are. They know the, the debt we owe in our country to, uh, to the veterans. The reason why I hope one day we'll go to the Philippines is I have so many American veteran friends who live there, but my, my father-in-law is a retired Philippine colonel who trained twice in, in, in the U.S. Um, it's, it's really important. My, uh, my wife's grandfather was in the Bata, survived the Bataan death march, uh, although he's, he's, he's passed away. And so we have these, these synergies now. Explaining cryptocurrency to my father is a challenge. You know, they they still like, whoa, what are you talking about? But okay. So I think we we have a, the the uniqueness is because it is a a veteran organization because it is looking to help. You will get people who ordinarily might dismiss you if you were talking about just a new cryptocurrency. Yeah. They're willing to listen. Yeah, I think, um, so two things come to mind. One is um, when we first started talking about this nonprofit effort, I was all in, like, I definitely, because I've been looking for a way to get involved in nonprofit work for a few years. Mm -hmm. And I'd done a little bit here and there, but I hadn't fully immersed myself into a project. So this was a great opportunity for me. And then once I committed to it, I realized I needed to talk to my son because he had been working with cryptocurrencies for a while and I didn't even, like, I still had to learn the, like when you watch the bootcamp videos, I wonder how many of those were Aaron got those ideas for me. Cause I'm asking like, what do you mean? I need to get a wallet. What do you mean? I need, like, I don't understand. So I had to learn very, very quickly to be able to articulate what we're trying to do and how. Um, so that was really fascinating and eye opening for me as an older guy, having to reach out to my kid to figure out how to do some things, which, he, I'm sure he loved every minute of it. <laughs> but um, so we're, we're getting ready to, to kind of wrap things up now. Um, so I just want to offer you an opportunity, you know, if we didn't get a chance to talk about something that you've talked about to others or you think is very poignant and, and impactful, I'd, I'd love to hear your perspectives on anything that we haven't really discussed yet. Well, Russ, like you, my son, Miggy, was my educator. <laughs> he really, uh, and thank God, he's a patient young man. <laughs> because, uh, he had explained everything two or three times. Uh, and so that I'm grateful to, to him for. Yep. Also, uh, my long-term friend, who I hope to see in person someday soon, Elmer, um, the fact that he was working on his own cryptocurrency for his business in the Philippines and has been very serious and devoted to us um, in trying to 
to, to help us get this off the ground. Yep. It's wonderful. Uh, but again, nothing beats the quality of the men and women that we have in our group. Uh, one thing Alex and I have learned after we left government service and started going into the business world, we thought, wow, the business world, these guys are they're making money. They've got to be the best people in the world, the smartest, <laughs> most ethical. Boy, were we naive. <laughs> yeah. Boy, were we naive. So we like dealing with people who are transparent, whom we can trust, who you know the old American thing about handshake counts. That's all Alex and I've ever had is a handshake. That's all I need with you guys is a handshake. Uh, not so much with some of the other people I deal with. <laughs> <laughs> Several contracts uh, and and determination. Uh, my brother-in-law is here now. He's uh, visiting. He's a, he's a retired chief, and uh, it was funny that his son is also into crypto, which has gotten him interested. So it gives me something to to explain explain to him about the importance of of this, giving him a chance to uh, understand and, and join at the right time. So wonderful organization, wonderful people willing to change the world, not take no uh, for an answer and not be disrupted by, by naysayers. So I think that we will continue forward. There'll be challenges yep. along the way. And we're, go we're going to, uh, we owe, we owe the veterans this. That's true. Um, so my countdown timer on the free uh, Zoom capability tells me I have one minute left. So, so, so this is very timely conclusion. Uh, it's been a distinct pleasure and honor for me to, to talk to you this morning, Harry, and I appreciate you taking time out of your schedule uh, to indulge me with this effort. And just thank you and glad you're on the board with us. We couldn't, we're, make, we're making progress through your insights. Um, thank you. And for it's, it's... Me. Thank you for your patience uh, <laughs> with me. I really appreciate it. I en tremendously enjoyed the May 12th event. I look forward to that, and I have October on my calendar uh, for Los Angeles. Yeah, that's a secret. We'll, we'll put information out I'm later. Edit that then. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Harry. Thank you, Ross. Have a great weekend.